Testing, testing. Excellent. Thank you. Basically, this job is keep it on cap. for the bells. Good morning. Welcome to church this morning and I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Cheryl Beal and this morning is um, Veterans Weekend and we would like to have you please join us in a moment of silence to recognize all those people who have fought in wars, who are victims of wars, who are current suffering because of all the wars and to pray for peace and reconciliation. This morning for our call to worship, I would ask you to join me with the response on the boards uh, that are adjacent to me or in the back of the church if that's where you are. God of the impossible, we pray for justice, peace, and reconciliation. When the challenges seem too many, Remind us of your resurrection power. When the task seems overwhelming, remind us of the miracle of love. When, when apathy threatens us, remind us of your vision of the world made whole. Help us to hope that the impossible can happen and live as if it might do so today. Amen. Now I'll ask you to please rise and join me in the opening hymn, number 340. This is my song.
and second graders coming through the sanctuary uh, last week, and I saw one of them come up here and go Bleh, and push that down, and I was sitting right out there and thought, I gotta get that fixed before church on Sunday, and here we are. It was such a joy, though, to have them here and to have them coming through. And uh, there are three different groups of second graders, and our own Tony Falsgraf was one of the teachers and uh, coming through, and they were here, and they were in the Memorial Garden. Um, seeing a different kind of cemetery was how Nancy Spade introduced that. It was beautiful. And, and then uh, they were down in the grotto, and Donna, you were teaching them, and it was, and Lee, you were part of that too. And uh, it was just really a beautiful time to open our church to that next generation. We're thankful for our community. We're thankful for all that God does in us and through us. We're thankful for this church. We're thankful for this day, the fact that we were uh, invited to arise from our beds and walk into it. We're thankful for all God's blessings. And out of that deep well of gratitude, we give back with thanks and praise. And so I invite the ushers to come forward for the morning offering. We have moved the anthem to later in the worship service to follow the text of the scripture because it's such a beautiful reflection and echo of that text. And so Phil will play an offertory and then move us right into 606. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. So when you hear Phil make that transition, let's rise and sing together. Okay, so what does pledge mean? 
when you when you break that apart, pledge of allegiance, let's just look at the word pledge. What does the word pledge mean? To what? To swear to something. That's great. Thank you, Andrew. To swear to something. Other words we might say that that are kind of like the same as pledge, only different words. We don't say it very often, do we? We don't say the word pledge very often. Well, we say it every day at school. We say it. I think in this country we understand the word pledge. In the, in, out in the world we understand that as the Pledge of Allegiance. I don't think we say it very often. But pledge is a very, very, very old word. And I want to teach you a little bit of a deeper meaning. Do you want to A promise. I love that. Thank you. Yes, it's a promise. It's we're we're um, we're guaranteeing something. Watch this. I'm going to show you the sign language for the word pledge. Okay, um, you start with your left hand right in front of your heart, roughly in front of your heart. Left hand here, left hand here, and you're going to put your index finger right here. And this is what this is. You're going to go from your from your word. That's the sign. It goes like that. But here's what's happening, and I love this about sign, because if you want to know why a sign is what it is, you can find out by Googling that. What is the meaning behind the sign language, or the American sign language, for a word? So word pledge, your word, and there's a sense that you're putting your word, locking it in your left hand before your heart. So it's like this, right? Locking it right in front of my heart. Now some people in American Sign Language, there's another level of this sign which I like even better. It goes like this, here, to hear, and to hear. So it goes like this, boom, boom, boom. You know what I love about that? What, why, would, why is this even better to do this? Why is it even better? When you do it, how do you feel it differently, Leo? It's a secure, yes, it's a security. We're guaranteeing this pledge we're making. It's a from my word, Sometimes you hear, like, I don't know if your parents ever say this to you. I used to say it to my kids, and they'll still say it to me now. Your word is your bond, is a phrase. Your word is your bond. When you say it, follow through on it. Make it a real thing. So you say it, make it real, secure it. And you put this sign in American Sign Language. I love this about American Sign Language. You put it in front of your heart. Because this is that place where you're making that promise secure. So today we're going to talk about pledges that we make to the church and to each other. And I want you to think about the word promise. And I want you to think about the word swearing to do something. Um, and I want you to think about all these people. And can you remember or can you think of any promises that we make to each other in church? Can you think of anything we, we ever stand up and actually make a promise about? Where is, where is Miss Charlotte? I saw her earlier. Where is Miss Charlotte? Where is she? Charlotte was right up here with me. Yeah, Charlotte was right up here with me um, on Pentecost last year. So in May last year, Charlotte was right up here with me. And the congregation, the whole church promised when I baptized Charlotte. No, Charlotte was Easter Sunday. I'm, yeah, Charlotte was Easter Sunday. Charlotte was Easter Sunday. Penny and Ella were Pentecost. Charlotte was right here with me, and the whole church promised, and um, they promised to love you. They promised to nurture you and teach you. They promised to guide you in the way of following Jesus. And we all did the same thing with Ella and Penny on Pentecost. We said, we all said, we promise to love you. We promise to nurture you, to teach you, to grow with you, walk with you as you learn to follow Jesus. And you remember, I don't know if you guys were here, but we had those two little twins. We had Ada and Walter, and they sat in this front row, the two twin babies. And that was in July. And we all promised that we would love them, we would teach them, we would guide them as they come to walk and follow Christ. How? Okay, so that's great. So that was here. We said this, but we're locking it here. We're securing it here. We're making it a sure promise we're committing to. How do we make that? How do we make good on that promise? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to broaden this out and ask everybody this question. What are some of the ways we make good on that promise we all make to love you, 
to teach you, to walk with you. I think we say teach you in word and deed to grow and follow Christ. Ta- just raise your hand. What, how do we, what are some of the ways we all make good on the promises that we make, those pledges we make? Lori. We teach. So those of you who are in the rainbow room, you recognize that lady because she's been in there with you teaching. How else do we make good on the promise? Who in? I just want to point, I just want to say what Mrs. What Luann just said. She said, we can all check in with you and see how you're doing with your life. We can all have a part of that check in with you. That was awesome. Thank you. How else? Yes, Andrew. We can. We can set a positive example because you guys are watching, aren't you? You're watching how we are with each other. You're watching how we are with you. You're paying attention to how we are. And, that, and that's, we can set an example. What else? What other ideas do you have? Yeah, what about that? How would that feel if you had somebody from church that kind of came and, and you know them from church, but they came and they came for you. They came to your sporting event for you. They came to your track event. They came to your swimming event. They came to your, you know, they came, they came to see you and to encourage you. How would that feel? What else do you think? Jan. Oh, oh, oh. we're happy to see you every Sunday. We tell you that. Anybody else have another idea? Yeah. We, pay, we make, okay, now what, what, we, what we just heard from Kathy was we make this place as welcoming as possible. Okay, when you go down to the grotto or when you go to the rainbow room um, and, Mrs., and Mrs. Andre teaches you down in the grotto or, or Mrs. Burchett or somebody else teaches you, Sam teaches you in the rainbow room, they're using a curriculum. They, they don't make this stuff up. They're act, we're buying that, right? So when this congregation actually gives financial support to the church, when they follow through with their pledge to the church, they're actually buying things that we're using to teach you. They're paying for Sam's salary. So Sam is here because that's how they're fulfilling their pledge, right? See how that goes? Anything else that hasn't been said that you would like to say that would say, this is how I would like you to love me? Any ideas you have that have, haven't been said, how, how you would like to be loved? Well, I want us to think about this whole idea of pledging to something, committing to something, and really, and not, and not, just, the, not just this, where we do this, but the, uh, that we make that sure, that we guarantee that, that we're going to stand by that, that we're going to make good on that promise to each other. And, you know, what I want us to start doing here, and I think I can, I can fix this. This is something I think I can fix. When we bring in new members, we aren't saying that same baptismal promise that we say to a new, a new baptized child. We aren't saying we're going to promise to love you and to walk with you. And we're going to start saying that because that's the promise we're making to each other. We're going to love each other and we're going to walk with each other and we are going to stay by each other as we pledge to do right? I need, I need the grotto kids to help me by handing out, you guys are going to give something to the congregation, and the rainbow room kids are going to give something else to the congregation. So Sam has something on your way out to your classes, and don't forget the choir, so somebody remember to give the choir. This is this year's pledge booklet. Now, I want you to just somebody, um, Mackenzie, open that up and tell me, open that up, and do you recognize any of the people that are in there? Maybe Rainbow Room. Take a look, you guys. Take a look. Spark Bible characters are in the pledge booklet this year. Isn't that cool and fun? So when you go home today, will you do this pledge for me? Will you ask your parents, whether it's today or tomorrow, will you ask them to sit down with you with this book and share what's in here with you? Will you do that? And and will you, all right, so you're going to take that out and you guys, Rainbow Room, you're going to give hugs to every single person here little Hershey hugs, and as you thank them for loving you, all right? We love you. We're good? We're good. We're good. And God, go with them as they go to learn and follow you. Thank you. Thank you so much.
are going out, I, I just want to draw your attention to a couple things you'll find in here. These characters that are in here are actually the characters from the Spark Bibles that we give to our kids. Um, well, our younger kids get Spark Bibles, and these characters are our faces that are in those Bibles. Uh, and so it makes it really kind of a fun little piece that you can share with families. And then don't, you know, if you open it, you'll have this card invariably fall out of it. So I want to draw your attention that this card is in there as well. You'll hear this more than just this moment, but we will dedicate pledges for 2024 in two Sundays. So two Sundays from now, we'll dedicate those pledges. Thanks, you guys, for helping. Did everybody get one? Did everybody get a hug? And a thank you for loving me. So, uh, ever, uh, so some people didn't get one yet and they need one. Yeah. Don't be shy. Don't be bashful. We have enough hugs and we have enough pledge brochures. Raise your hand if you didn't get one. They've got them for you. <laughs> and as uh, as we're saying goodbye to you guys, um, I'm going to also invite Kevin Burchett, who is uh, the finance elder from our session, to come to uh, the lectern. Can you hear me in the choir okay? Good. Uh, good morning, and as uh, Kathy said, my name is Kevin Burchett. I'm one of the uh, church elders, and I'm representing Session today. Congratulations, you came to Pledge Sunday. But seriously, as a church family, um, Session believes it's really important to share in the critical aspects of uh, church's financial health and, and long-term sustainability. Um, so as we promised at the beginning of the year, in an effort to uh, be open and transparent about our finances, we'd like to provide a brief update of our finances um, at, as of the end of September. And I will also introduce the pledge uh, campaign today. Um, so the next slide is church operations includes salaries, utilities, insurance, normal repair and maintenance. Uh, the operational budget is also how we support our mission partners, both locally and globally. And let's not forget, it provi the, the, the operational budget provides us an opportunity um, and basis to reflect on God's grace and to be the hands and feet of Christ. The offerings and gifts allow us to, well, let's just put it this way. Our offerings and gifts allow us to be who we are and to continue the important ministry we are in. And we certainly know the world needs that today. Um, the next slide is the third quarter actual budget summary. And before I really get into that, I do want to make a note that uh, we have two incredible members of our church who volunteer their time as our financial secretary in Doug Bird and the treasurer in uh, Mary Hammond. They both do a wonderful job and they um, are my mentors. Um, so in that white column, you're going to see the number 29,634. That is the amount of deficit spending that session forecasted and expected at the end of the third quarter. Now, the year's not over yet. That was just a third quarter projection. And that was based on an annual deficit budget that we expected would be about $40,000. As you can see, the three-quarter point receipts are about 92% of what was projected, and the expenses are about 3% over budget. The result 
is instead of a deficit of 120, wait, <laughs> instead of a deficit of 29,000, the deficit is actually about 48,000 at this point. So let's look at the receipts and expenses a little closer. The next slide, um, I'll go through this briefly because this is the church service. And so if anybody wants any detail on this, I'll be available after church for questions. I can provide detail in any amount that you'd like, any, in, anything in the coming days. So here we can see the receipt category in more detail. There's, there's really, um, the reason this is lower is basically three reasons, and you can see what they are right there. The mission-directed uh, category funds uh, come primarily from fundraisers and our Presbytery mission offering, like One Great Hour of Sharing or the Peace and Global Witness. This is an area that we overestimated at the beginning of the year. However, there's still time, or maybe we didn't, but at this time, it seems like we overestimated, and there's still some planned um, fundraisers. In fact, this afternoon, that's why I asked you, the uh, community partnership is having trivia uh, challenge this afternoon, and there are some other uh, issues, uh, fundraisers they're involved in for the rest of the year. I'm sure we'll hear about those. Um, the gift category, mission, including that, uh, the, the gift category reflects contributions from those who did not pledge but gave freely, and hopefully the fourth quarter we'll see higher gifts and offerings uh, because typically the last quarter of the year is the most, is when most people give. So we expect that to come closer. Now the pledge category is the other category, and as you know, this is the category that's most dependable and frankly should be the uh, basis of our budget. Um, I've been told that based on the timing of some of the pledges that, have, that were made this year, we'll still be within 98% of our pledge budget, uh, which was 165,000. Last year, the church received a little over 100% of pledges. And the year before, it was 99% of pledges. So I think you can see why we talk a lot about pledges, and you'll be hearing more about that in the weeks to come. The next slide is the um, expenses. Expenses were a little higher than normal for the nine months. And there's a few reasons. Primarily, a few line items in the 22, 2023 budget were underestimated. An example of one thing that was underestimated in our budget was the uh, liability and property insurance. And you may have noticed at home, my insurance has gone up, the cost of materials, everybody's insurance is going up. Uh, it happened at the church, too. And um, we underestimated 2023. This, along with other expenses, have been corrected for the 2024 budget. So when you see the 2024 budget here in a minute, you're going to see that it's higher than this year, and this is the reason why. We're making it correct so that we know what to expect. Um, while being over budgeted, uh, being over budget by $6,000 is not good, let's put it in perspective. That's only 3% over our budget at this point, and we're not done with the year. Now, the reason you see those asterisks is to point out that the music spending comes from a music fund. It's called a restricted fund, and we're going to hear more about that in a second. And the non-salaried expenses for education come out of the legacy fund. So if you add those numbers up, it's not going to add up to the bottom because the bottom row is what came out of the real budget. And I'm sorry if that's too complicated, but... I can explain that in detail if you'd like. I, the point is, though, we do use restricted funds to pay for some of our items. Music and education is an example. Okay. So let's look at what that brings us for our current assets, which is the next slide. And this is the update on cash reserves. Um, and I explained this before, and I'll explain it again. You know, at some, we all at home, most of us, our income goes into a checking account, and then we pay our bills. Same thing happens to the church. All the offerings and donations going to our checking account, and then we pay our bills. 
And as you can see, the reduction in the checking and savings account this year is $53,000. I was told not to pull any punches on this and to be very truthful and honest. Now there's two factors that play into a $50,000 use of our funds. First, we planned on spending $30,000 more than we were going to take in, right? Remember, I just explained we had a $30,000 deficit. So by this time, we should have taken $30,000 out of our savings. The reason it's more is because, as we saw in an earlier slide, the combination of less receipts and higher expenses have resulted in a net increase of our deficit of $20,000. That brings it to fifty. dollars so below that then is our Edward Jones account. And the good news there is that has increased by $15,000 this year. That's a fund that's been designated as an investment account. And hopefully we can leave it that way, right? And we won't need to use it. And hopefully that is there for our next generation. But the money's available if we need it as we transition into balanced budgets, which we have to get to. Uh, to bring a little more clarity, that restricted funds amount, um, that's the amount of money that has been specified for specific musics, like uh, reasons like music and education. Restricted funds are not available for day-to-day -day use. They're, 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 they're specifically for something. And uh, that brings our operational amount of money that we have in the bank that we can use to pay our bills to 165000 How am I doing, okay? Following this? If not, again, I'm available. So let's go to those restricted funds now, because I'm pretty excited about this. That, that's a lot of money. That's $50,000 we have setting aside to use for specific things. Donations into these funds are, again, used for specific, not for operating. The music fund supports the music, purchase of new music, guest instrumentals, and uh, music-related expenses. Uh, we've utilized $2,000 of that this year, and there's still $1,800 left. The legacy fund supports new ministries. It's seed money to help things grow and uh, particularly in education. And for that, it's things like the Follow Me curriculum, the Calvin Symposiums, the Vacation Bible Schools, the things that Kathy was talking to the youth about. These are the things we do for um, the, the education here. Again, we've used about 2,000, and there's $14,000 left in that to use. There's a Colibarium Fund. This is dedicated and reserved for maintenance and care of the church's columbarium. And then there's the Heritage Fund. Now this fund has continued to grow. There was another $11,000 put into that this year. And you notice how much of that came from our ones at a time, 1,700 bucks. So that adds up. I'm gonna take a little more time on the Heritage Fund than I normally would have because this is important. We're proud caretakers of this historic facility. What is it, 160, 155 years old? And this has been a topic of conversation among members of our church for about the last six, seven months, and I think it's time to address that. Um, a few years ago, the church underwent a very successful capital campaign, and they raised money for the new roof, and upgraded lighting. Once the projects, uh, the goals were met, there was money left over. And since the capital drive for the building upgrades was intended for building upgrades, Session des designated the remaining balance of the, uh, as kind of, it's called an obsolescence fund. In other words, it's for things that break or need replaced. You see, people on Session at that time understood the importance of having a separate fund outside of normal operating funds to set aside for unexpected building repairs. That's very smart. Now, one thing we've recently used that for is for the microphones 
and the sound system, and I've heard a lot of positive response about that, but that instead of coming out of our budget, which was already a deficit, we used that out of the heritage fund. So I think you can see how that works. Over the last several months, a capital needs list has been developed and it's sizable. It was input from our facilities committee as well as many others that have a stake and have been working with our building. Session intends to proactively address the list over the next three to five years by developing a capital improvements plan that you all can be part of if you'd like, and you probably will be anyway, we're gonna talk about it. So this, this improvement plan will put together an, a, a, I don't know a better word, a plan, right? So that we can get these things addressed and stop talking about them, the, 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 you know, the ceiling is, is, is on there, is that more important than foundation? Those are the things we're gonna have conversations about so in the meantime, we expect about $20,000 to be left, right? At the end of the year, it's 24 now, but there's another project coming, but it would be about $20,000 left. We've talked a lot about operational budget today and our pledge drive. So in addition to an operation budget next year, we are actually gonna have a separate capital budget so everybody knows what we're gonna spend money on outside of our operations next year. Next year, it's gonna, at this point, unless there's a change right now, session is believing that is going to be addressing the most critical issues first, which is the church foundation of this old building. Now, if you look around, the foundation is wearing. And we're also gonna spend money on the structural causes, such as the gutters and things that are causing water damage. This most likely will deplete what is currently in the heritage fund. So we're going to go through that 20,000 and we'll have something done to help the church. Therefore, in the future projects, we're going to need a plan of action. And that comes back to what? The three to five year plan. And that's our 2023 update. I'd like to move on into our provisional budget for next year and um, because 2023 is kind of in the books now, we've just got a few weeks left. We really need to start thinking about next year. So if you wanna to go to the next slide, um, I have three slides left, they're in your brochure. So go ahead and open those up if you'd like, or you can look up here either way, but in the back of the brochure, you'll see a chart. Now this budget is only a first draft. We believe this is what's needed to maintain, without drastic cuts, this is what's need to maintain who we are today and the services we provide. This is the amount of money, the 287,000 that we believe we need, the church needs, not we, but all of us, the church, um, needs to be, keep on keeping on who we are. Now there's a few items in there you're gonna see that have exceptionally high increases. The facility budget increased by 30%, simply put, that's due to underestimation of costs like insurance and utilities. We're making that correct now. If you look at traditional cost over, you see that one that goes over uh, to 2022, it was 65,000 in 2022, then we lowered the budget to 50 and lo and behold, guess what we're gonna spend this year? Back to 65, so let's make it more realistic. Office operations shows an increase of 17% year over year. This is due to a single line item of computers and software that have been increasing the efficiencies in communications. And then you see a 22% increase in mission and outreach. Well, that's because we're a tithing church and we set the amount of our tithing to our mission partners at 10% of the budget. And then finally, the pie chart represents how we designate actual expenses. This method distributes staff and pastor salaries into appropriate ministry areas based on the time spent in each of these areas. So it allows us to, without getting bogged down in all the numbers, it allows us uh, to see how our offerings and our gifts are being utilized 
rather than take time to list all of the good we as a church family are doing to follow Jesus, I urge you to read the pamphlet, which was put together by Lisa and Steph. I think Steph has such a wonderful uh, sense of humor and talent. If anything, you'll get a chuckle out of reading the pamphlet, um, but especially the center pages. So uh, that, con <clears throat> that concludes my update and uh, pledge kickoff. you to join me in the prayer of confession. Holy God, hear our prayer. There are chasms in our lives, deep valleys that separate us from one and another and from you. We confess that we have grown allowed the rifts to grow for fear of admitting our part in this separation for fear of being rejected when we reach out. You call us to a reconciled life, to healed relationships, to a wholeness with each other and with you. Mend us, we pray, and make us new creations through the power and love of Christ in whose name we pray, amen. Good news. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to God's self, not counting our trespasses against us, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. Friends, no that we are forgiven and be at peace. The peace of Christ be with you. I invite you to turn to your neighbor in the pew across the room, offer a show of peace to each other, gesture of peace and goodwill to each other. We turn to our scripture reading from today. It is from, it is uh, some say as old as 3000 year old story from the book of Ruth, which if you try to find the book of Ruth in the Old Testament, it's actually pretty early in the books of the Old Testament. Cheryl and I will be offering this uh, story to you back and forth. I'll, I'll be reading the, um, Cheryl will be reading the, the white print and I'll be reading the colored print, but if you just kind of look, open your hearts and ears and minds to this story, this old, old story from the book of Ruth. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem of Judah went to live in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, God is king. The name of his wife, Naomi, means uh, pleasant. The name of his two children, his two sons were Machlan, meaning sickly, and Kilian, meaning vanquished or dead. <laughs> Think about that when you're thinking about the name. Of your <laughs> Let's name this one sickly, this one dead. They were embodying the famine, clearly. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem and Judah, and they went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Emelech and the husband of Naomi died, and she was left with two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of one was Opa, and the name of the other was Ruth. When they lived there about 10 years, both Machlon and Kilian also died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. And then she started to return with her daughter-in-laws from the country of Moab. 
For she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had considered his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she had been living, she and her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughter-in-laws, go back, each of you, to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the deed, with the dead, and with me. The Lord grant that you may find security, each of you, in the house of your husband. Then Amen. she kissed them, and they wept aloud, and they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Do I still have sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I'm too old to have a husband. Even if I thought there was hope for me, even if I should have a husband tonight and bear sons, would you then wait until they were grown? Would you then refrain from marrying? No. My daughters, it's been far more bitter for me than for you, because the hand of the Lord has turned against me. Then they wept aloud. Opah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. So she said, look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, do not press me to leave you to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there will I be buried. May the Lord do thus to me and more as well if even death parts me from you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, there I will stay. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Ruth makes a pledge to Naomi. She will forsake her tribe, her land, her culture, everything she has known to be familiar, and she will travel as a stranger to a foreign land. She will hold fast to Naomi. This month, we are exploring the discipleship practice cross borders. And Ruth exemplifies this. I said last week that wandering is in our spiritual DNA, and we have story after story in our sacred book about ancestors of our faith who have journeyed out of their comfort zones into a strange land. Peregrinatio pro amore Christi, the ancient Celtic Christians called it journey for the love of God, of Christ. In his book, Abraham, A Journey to the Heart of Three Faiths, author Bruce Feiler writes, Abraham is blessed, the nations of the world are blessed because he had the courage to go to another place and make himself a stranger. At some time in our lives, Feiler writes, all of us have to go to another place too and make ourselves strangers. It's true throughout our lives, isn't it? Sometimes we go by choice. Sometimes we find ourselves in unknown lands, unfamiliar territory. We've never been here before. We don't know what the future holds. Leaving home for college for the first time or transitioning into a senior living facility, starting a new job, entering retirement, changes in health, learning to walk again, navigating memory loss. Our own bodies can feel like a strange land to us. And we cling to these biblical stories of exile or wilderness wanderings because they're so familiar to us. They are so human to us. They remind us that there is light in the darkness, that there is water that springs forth from the desert, that there is a new way when we can see no way. In the journeys of our spiritual ancestors, we see the potential of our own journeys, and we hope and we pray that we too will encounter the steadfast love that is God on the road we travel. So today we have the story of Ruth, whose name means friendship, and Naomi, whose name means pleasant, but she calls herself bitter. It's a story we often read at weddings. Did any of you have this story in your wedding? I'm just curious. Oh, a couple. It's a story of embodied commitment, of forging a new family, of clinging, of cleaving. It's the same verb, Hebrew verb, that's found in that Genesis. A man leaves his family, a woman leaves her family, they cleave unto each other. It's clinging, cleaving, holding fast to each other. And it's a story for the church of pledging fidelity to one another and to the whole body of walking alongside one another in times of joy and abundance and in times of grief and loss, refusing to leave one another even when someone is hard to be with, recognizing that the experiences of life can overwhelm us, debilitate, and leave any of us, all of us, from a time, anyway, for a time bitter or angry or fearful and hurt to the point where we will try to push people away we have loved so that we can brood or lick our wounds and keep telling ourselves that no one cares, no one will miss us, we're better off alone. And the church, the church says no. We will not leave you. You are bone of our bone. You are flesh of our flesh. 
When you are hurting, we are hurting, and we will stay with you. We will walk with you. We will sit in silence with you. We will give you grace. We will give you a compassionate heart. We will go through this strange land. We will grow through this, whatever this is, together. Peregrinatio pro amore Christi, journeying together. Ruth's for each other. Spiritual friends pledged to one another, encouraging one another with and for the love of Christ. I know this is not always the case. And yet, isn't it always the ideal? Isn't it always the goal, the aspiration, the call for us as church? Like Ruth and Naomi, we come from different tribes. We come from different families, different backstories. We've grown up with different spiritual traditions. How many of you here, raise your hand if you grew up Presbyterian? I look around. Raise your hand if you grew up Catholic, Lutheran, Methodist, <laughs> right? Orthodox? <laughs> Any Baptists? Unitarians? How about if you, if you call yourself a product of any beautiful array of all of these? How many of you didn't grow up at church at all? How many, I mean, we, we've, just by the variety that's here, we've been taught different prayers. We've sung from a variety of hymnals. I often hear the question, why don't we sing our favorite old hymns? And I will tell you that those favorite old hymns are not the same favorite old hymns across the congregation. We practice a variety of prayer postures, sitting and standing and kneeling. We cross ourselves, we bow our heads, we close our eyes, we raise our hands, we pray with beads. We light candles and we meditate, we burn incense, we do yoga and drumming and crystal bowl sound bathing. We prefer King James and the message and the new revised standard. We love silence and sinking our teeth into a lively debate about the Bible. We hate the organ and we love the organ. We are a mash of all kinds of personal spiritual preferences. We're Democrats and we're Republicans and independents. We're from Michigan and Ohio and probably some other states. We're post-war generation, boomers, millennials, Gen Xers, and Gen Zs. We're altos, sopranos, basses, tenors, and any other notes on the page and off the page. We go by he and she and they. And we are all here together heart to heart and soul to soul, loved by Jesus, and called to love each other steadfastly and to walk alongside each other in his way. And that is church. We are to be Ruth's to each other. We are to be spiritual friends to each other, pledged to each other, sharing our experiences of faith, journeying through life in and out of strange new lands, and yet at home with one another. If that's not good news, I do not know what good news is. That's good news, and it's not easy news, and you know that, and I know that, because crossing borders isn't about just making space for anyone to be whatever they want to be and whoever they are. It's about venturing into strange new lands by moving toward each other, opening our hearts to the life stories of each other, embracing the unique humanness of each other, the raw pain and the exhilarating joy and letting ourselves be changed by God through each other, becoming new family in Christ. When we pledge to this church, that is what we're pledging to. This wild and crazy and beautiful peregrinatio del amore Christi, journey for the love of Christ, that is First Presbyterian Church to come see. The Imago Dei in me sees the Imago Dei, honors the Imago Dei in every one of you. Thanks be to God.
Let's rise in body and spirit and, and sing hymn number 727, Will You Let Me Be Your Servant. We turn our hearts toward one another now in uh, sharing of joys and concerns. For many, and I've heard this from you many, this is your favorite part of the worship service because this is when we turn toward one another and we open ourselves up to each other, seeking prayer from each other, being vulnerable with each other. And so I stand behind the baptismal font, reminding us all that this is our home as we share with each other. I don't know if someone has a microphone to Henry. <laughs> Thank you. Henry has a microphone, and if you have something to share, please raise your hand, speak directly into the microphone, introduce yourself and that which you would like to ask for in prayer. My name is Lisa Michelin. Um, and first of all, I want to say, Kathy, I just got chills during your service, and that was the best service I think I've ever heard. So thank you. And um, I hope everybody else is able to take your words away today and, and live into those. Um, in addition, I would like to ask for prayers for my brother-in-law, Dennis, who was diagnosed recently with um, an aggressive form of cancer, and he gets his port tomorrow, and he will um, start chemo this week. So prayers for him, please. Thank you, Lisa. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. I'm Kristen Chick, and I just want to um, let you know there was a wonderful Veterans Day ceremony and celebration at the Sculpture and Music Garden on Friday. Uh, Joe led the band. They were fabulous. Uh, there was a choir also presentation, and there were re there's wonderful signs that were made for each of the veterans that... <clears throat> let them know they wanted to have a sign and it was a fabulous ceremony and the day was beautiful and if you have a chance get over there and see the sculptures they're just the coolest thing they're made out of some kind of plastic wrap and they're all wrapped real tightly 
And I understand that at night they're um, a, a lit or lit up. I don't know what the correct, but uh, they're beautiful. So um, I'm, I'm thankful for every, anybody here that was involved in that or any, any of the veterans that were able to go or weren't able to go. It was wonderful. Thank you, Kristen. My name is William Fowle, and we all know the world's on fire right now. So uh, if we could all claim it and please pray for peace. On another great note, and we all have our fingers crossed and we're praying about it, the SAG-AFTRA strike looks like it's been settled. We'll all get the membership, we'll all get postcards and vote on it. There's been a lot of much controversy about it and they were on strike for 118 days. And it's not just actors doing television film for you all to see, but it's hairdressers, lighting people, makeup people. It's thousands and thousands and thousands of jobs. So uh, I wanted to share that joy. Thank, Thank you. you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers for this world for peace. I'm Carol Lou Weaver, and uh, I have two prayer requests. Um, uh, Angie's, Angela Child's, uh, uh, well, son's fiance is having some female problems today. She's really quite ill, and we ask for prayers for her. The other thing is Angie is having surgery for a knee replacement on Thursday at Hickman, and she'll be in the hospital for probably a couple of nights, a night or two anyway. We'd ask for prayers for her. Thank you, Carol Lou. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. I want to also ask for prayers for Judy Slater. Uh, Judy is not well. She has a respiratory uh, something, and um, she's very weak, and I'm concerned about her, and uh, so I ask for your prayers for her. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayers for Judy. I'm, I'm Louise Solomon, and I have something to share. I have a new great grandson. He was born Tuesday. It's Ethan Dale, and he is adorable. Do I need to say? <laughs> God, we give you thanks and praise for new life in Ethan. Any other prayers to share today? Okay, then let's rise in body or spirit to sing our final hymn together. Blessed be the, the tie that binds. And while we're singing at some point, Andrew, what, you could make your way up here for our deacon moment.
I just want to thank you all for the donations for the Tecumseh Service Club. Um, today is the last day that we'll be collecting for that, and we will be uh, having those uh, distributed to those in need this week. Um, but it looks like we had an absolutely great turnout for that. Uh, for the remainder of the year, we'll be working on the Sponsor of Family Charity Drive, which uh, Beth and Rochelle will be leading up. So if you have any questions about that or would like to get involved, please see one of them. Uh, also, I do want to bring up that Share the Warmth uh, dinner is next Saturday, and unfortunately, we have one person signed up is all right now. So we're in desperate need of getting some volunteers to help out with that. Uh, and thank you for the one person that has signed up already. <laughs> um, but that is Saturday, so please uh, don't hesitate. Get that signed up today uh, if you can, or if you uh, know somebody that would like to help out, uh, give them a call and have them contact me if they have any questions. The sign up is on the deacons board where it has usually has been for most of the last year and a half. <laughs> okay, so right, I will point it out to you after the service, but right uh, down the hallway on the deacons board, it's right in the middle of it there. So thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> uh, and the last thing I have for today is the exciting event that the community, community partnership team has uh, planned for this afternoon, which is DJ trivia. And have a little bit of music, a little test your knowledge, some food, and some fun. Uh, so please come. That will start at 4 and should wrap up around 6 p.m. Uh, it is $10, and I really do hope to see you all there. It's going to be a really good time. So thank you. I invite you to rise uh, as you are able for the charge and the benediction, and then Phil will play us out into the world. Let us journey for the love of Christ, and may the blessing of God of, of the God of peace and justice be with us. May the blessing of the Son, who weeps the tears of the world's suffering, be with us. May the blessing of the Spirit, who inspires us to reconciliation and hope, be with us now and forevermore. Amen.